Hello again, my friends in the Meadowood Ward. It's good to be with you again. I, I, I really long for the day when we can again meet in our Sunday school class and in our sacrament meetings and fellowship one with another. I miss that very much. The bishop has asked me if I wouldn't talk a little bit about the Book of Mormon today. Alma chapter 5, where the song of redeeming love is mentioned. I was chatting with uh, <coughs> uh, Roz the other day about how I miss singing and, and being in the choir. And that's one of the things that I've really <coughs> wondered if I should. Uh, it's made me long for getting together again in the ward, being able to sing. I can't sing very well, but I love to sing to the Lord. It's one of the great pleasures in life. Well, we're going to be talking about Alma chapter 5, the song of redeeming love. First of all, if you have your Book of Mormon handy, I hope you do, we, we want to read a few passages in there. Alma chapter 5, <clears throat> a song of redeeming love. And it begins, though, with a typical ancient Near Eastern beginning of, uh, to a, a sermon, and that is, his, he states his authority there in verse 3. Uh, three. I, Alma, having been consecrated by my father, Alma, to be a high priest over the church of God, he having power and authority from God to do these things, behold, I say unto you, that he began to establish a church at the land which was in the borders of Nephi, yea, the land which is called the land of Mormon, yea, and he did baptize his brethren in the waters of Mormon. If you ever were born again, <clears throat> you, you would probably remember a little bit about that sensation. When I chat with my evangelical friends and they talk about being born again, most of them can tell me the day and the hour and the place where they were born again. And they challenged me as a Latter-day Saint to be born again. And it reminded me of the people here in the Book of Mormon, uh, the, the people with Alma the Elder in the Land of Mormon. They always remembered that place as something very special to them because it was the place where they were born again and brought to the Savior, Jesus Christ. In, a, <clears throat> in chapter 5, verse 7, we ought to look at that here for a minute, where this is where Alma is talking to his people, Alma the Younger, and reminding them of some of these things that happened to them in that place, the, the land of Mormon, the waters of Mormon. Behold, God changed their hearts, yea, he awakened them out of a deep sleep, and they were awake unto God. Behold, they were in the midst of darkness, nevertheless, their souls were illuminated by the light of the everlasting word, yea, they were enriched about by the band, they were encircled about by the bands of death, and the chains of hell, and an everlasting destruction awaited them. But notice there at the beginning, he awakened them out of a deep sleep. It's not that they suddenly made themselves into somebody else. It was done to them. <clears throat> Notice also, when you go back to Mosiah chapter 5, the two chapters in the Book of Mormon that talk about being born again, Alma 5 and Mosiah 5. And in Alma chapter 5, verse 2, we uh, Mosiah chapter 5, verse 2, we find, yea, we believe all the words which thou hast spoken unto us, and also we know of their surety and truth, because of the Spirit of the Omnipotent, Lord Omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us, or in our hearts. That is, they were operated on by the Spirit, and their hearts were changed. That they had no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. <clears throat> Notice also that Abinadi's heart was changed when, he, when the Lord spoke to him, and that it was through Abinadi's preaching that Alma the Elder was converted, and his heart was changed. And then Alma the Elder, in his preaching, the hearts of his people were changed also. This is a process that, that begins when you hear the word, and, you're, and the Lord steps in and changes your heart. 
Alma's preaching led to a change of their hearts also here in uh, chapter 5. I want you to notice that all of the verbs in these passages, Mosiah 5.2, Alma 5.3, Alma 5.7, they're all in the passive voice, that is, their hearts were changed. They didn't change their hearts. The Lord stepped in and changed their hearts. So, if this has once happened to you, and I hope it has, I assume that everybody in our ward has had a change of heart at some point. Some people had to change, their hearts were changed more than others. Some people were converted more than others. But it was the Lord's doing that changed their hearts, and our hearts too. When I think of General Conference and my heart changing during General Conference, I don't really change my heart. I think the Spirit works on me during General Conference. When I hear our prophet speak, my heart is changed. Well, if that has happened to you, then Alma here begins in verse 14 asking a series of questions of those people who have had a change of heart. In verse 14, And now behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have ye spiritually been born of God? Have ye received his image in your countenance? Now these are people who were not there, for the most part, in the land of Mormon earlier when uh, Alma the senior was preaching there and they had a change of heart. This is the new generation and Alma is saying, have you had a change of heart as your ancestors did, as your progenitors did? <coughs> have, we ex uh, found, uh, have we experienced this change of hearts in our generation also? And then the question, have you received his image in your countenance? Have you experienced a mighty change of heart? That mighty change of heart is defined back in Mosiah chapter 2 when it says that they had no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually. <clears throat> that is the change that happens, the Lord, uh, that the Lord works in you when you are uh, uh, seeking him. And then, uh, and by the way, I think you've all experienced this in your wards and in that that you've been in and in the places you've been in life there are people who have the image of the Lord in their countenance they're the humble usually quiet people uh, people who are, are so good that you can feel their goodness I have no doubt that everyone that, that <coughs> has that image of the Lord in their countenance is going to be saved in the celestial kingdom. The opposite is true also. I've been in the presence of people whose countenance was quite fallen, as Cain's was in the book of Genesis. And they did not have the Lord's countenance, image in their countenance. Their, their countenance was really quite evil. And, and sometimes it's so evil that it's scary. And it's a very real thing, at least to me it is, this image of the Lord's countenance, in the, the image of the Lord in your countenance. Have you experienced this mighty change of heart with no more desire to do evil? Do you exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality and this corruption? And the older I get, the happier I am that this body will be raised in in corruption, from this corrupt state that it's in now, to stand before God to be judged according to the deeds which we have done in mortal life, in the mortal body. <clears throat> you know, we, we really cannot remove our sins and, and the stains of our sins from ourselves. No amount of suffering on our part can, re can remove the, the stain of sin. Only Christ's redemptive power can remove our sins. Some of you may remember that um, Elder Neil Anderson, uh, son, lived in our ward, and he would occasionally visit our ward. I remember one time looking up at the stand after I was released as bishop, I'm grateful that I wasn't the bishop, but there on the stand was poor Bishop Smith, and right next to him was the president of the stake, and right next to the president of the stake was Elder Anderson. And I'm thinking, I would not want to be in the shoes of that bishop that day. <clears throat> it brought up a question in my mind that I've asked people since then, and I think there's a good answer to it, but the question was, 
if in that meeting the high pr the, the priest who was saying the blessing on the sacrament messed up, whose responsibility was it to correct the priest? The apostle, the state president, or the bishop? Luckily, <laughs> the priest didn't make any mistakes. It was a good day that day. Well, anyway, <clears throat> um, Neil Anderson has written, Elder Anderson has written this book, The Divine Gift of Forgiveness. And there's an important passage in here that I wanted to bring in, in, in conjunction with Alma chapter 5. He says, A person cannot suffer for his sins, but he will suffer because of, because of his sins. There is always a punishment in sinning, but the punishment, the suffering, and the pain are caused by the sin, not by the repentance. When someone has cancer and surgery is required, it is not the surgery that is the cause of the suffering. It is the cancer. The surgery is temporarily difficult, but the cancer is the villain, not the surgery. Sin causes the suffering, not the repentance. And then he goes on to say, It is not our repentance that redeems us and qualifies us for the gift of divine forgiveness. It is our Savior, Jesus Christ. The prophet Nephi explained it beautifully when he said, It is by grace that we are saved, after all we can do. My friend Stephen Robinson used to say that all we can do in the Book of Mormon means repent. That's all we can do. We can't ever remove the stain of sin on it by ourselves. Continuing with Brother Anderson, it is not because of the things that we do to repent. We must clearly take the steps that change behavior. But it is not the change in behavior that saves us nor brings us forgiveness. Through faith in our Lord Savior and Savior Jesus Christ, we obtain the power to change. He is the giver of our forgiveness. I think that's exactly what Alma is saying here in, in Alma chapter 5. Going on with his questions about this, in that, verse 15, uh, after he's asked the question in the first part of the verse about um, do, we, uh, do we exercise faith in the redemption of him who created us, he's the one who removes the stain of sin from us. Then he asks, can we imagine God saying to us, your works have been the works of righteousness? Now, most of us really don't have any other kind of works, I don't think. In fact, most of us have long ago given up our disgusting sins. The only sins we really have left, as I've mentioned many times in the, in the science school class, are our favorite sins, the ones we kind of cherish and hold close to our heart. They're the ones that we're still doing and enjoying, usually. I used to argue with my colleagues in religion that, that, uh, who said, well, you can't sin and enjoy it. Well. I, I kind of disagree. I think people who sin find some kind of joy and satisfaction in it. And what needs to happen is to realize that only Christ can change you. Because when it says about talks about a change of heart, it's talking about not being yourself, changing yourself, changing into something else. And you don't change yourself. It's the Savior who steps in and changes who you are. So. When you're finding yourself and listing your, uh, your, your sins, and have, most of us, I hope, have a little list of sins, and your favorite ones are way down at the bottom because you don't want to bother with them right now. You enjoy them too much. You have to say in your heart, I, I hope the Savior will change my favorite sins into disgusting ones so that I will give them up. And you pray that the Lord will change your heart they will become disgusting and that you'll want to give them up. Anyway, I think that's what it's saying there in verse 15. And none of us is silly enough, I, I don't think, to, to try and lie to God at the judgment day and say that our works were works of righteousness when they weren't works of righteousness. When we arrive at the judgment bar, according to Alma, or no, according to 2 Nephi, 
chapter 9, <coughs> verse uh, 14. Hmm, going in the wrong place. There we go. When we get there at the judgment bar, we will have a perfect knowledge of all our... Now notice what he does here. He lists three, three things we'll have a perfect knowledge of. Of our guilt, our uncleanness, and our nakedness. But then he reverses it and lists the three things that we'll have knowledge of our righteousness. That is, opposite to the, our guilt will be a, a knowledge of our enjoyment. Opposite of our uncleanness will be knowledge of our righteousness. Opposite our nakedness will be our knowledge of being clothed with purity. And we will have a perfect knowledge of that. And we will not be able to look at the Lord and say, my works were righteous when they weren't. It just is not going to happen that way. <clears throat>